How many people can Earth support? This question plagues people. It keeps people up at night. Once you realize that we live in this little speck in the middle of space, nothing gets in, nothing gets out. It really can wheedle in there, you know? Most studies find that we could have eight to 16 billion people on this little planet. This is referred to as the planet's carrying capacity. And eventually the system is gonna break down. Mathematicians, environmentalists, economists, they're all working on how we can get more people to live on this planet. 10 billion is the tippity top, the tippity top. How do we get to where we need to be to feed everyone? Let's kick into it. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining. Episode four of Five Starts Now. This week we're talking about how many people the planet can realistically support. People love to throw out different numbers. You know, if everywhere was built with the density of Hong Kong, we could fit trillions of people on our planet, which is silly because those people would need to eat and drink and excrete waste and probably go outside once in a while. If the American diet was adopted by everyone on the opposite end here, we could feed maybe one and a half billion people. That's how bad our diet is. <laughs> but that's not the whole picture. Because right now we have seven and a half billion. The UN predicts 9.7 billion by 2050 and 11 billion by 2100. If we can't feed people, then we're gonna have mass famine, food shortages, war, I mean, who knows? Are we on the brink? Experts think not yet. We learned back in episode one earlier on that you can save money by cutting meat out of your diet. You can save $750 a year by becoming a vegetarian fully, and you can save fractions of that by cutting meat out of your diet. It's great. The United Nations Global Environmental Service looked at dozens of papers from the last 30 years, and they organized the estimates into this amazing graph that I've recreated here for you. And this echoes what I said earlier. We can support eight to 16 billion. According to the Harvard University sociobiologists, Edward Wilson, the common limiting factor is fresh water and the amount of arable land. If you have 10 billion people with no cattle, not taking into account the rainfall, nitrogen cycle, available quantities of phosphorus, which are all problems when you're growing lots of food for lots of people, the three and a half billion acres that we use today, the two billion tons of grain annually, would be enough to feed 10 billion vegetarians or two and a half billion US omnivores. So let's be honest. You're never gonna get 100% vegetarian society globally. It's not gonna happen. If we could do anything, what would we do? Mathematical biologist Joel Cohen, in his book, How Many People Can Earth Support? Great question, Joel. I've heard that one. There are three paradigms. A lot of a paradigm. In the face of a global catastrophe, one needs a bigger pie, fewer forks, and better manners. See, I, I see what you did there, JC, making the like food jokes, it's, it's nice. So one, bigger pie. In post-World War II, the huge issues with food caused famine all over the globe, and we were worried we wouldn't make enough food to feed ourselves. The American experiment actually did such a good job with that, that Soviet scientists came to see how we're, our farms worked in this country. It's amazing. It was called the farms race, and I really wanna make a whole video just about that. You can look it up, it's amazing. Anyway, Norman Borlaug bred two special wheat he took wheat with high yield and he mixed it with wheat that was short, stocky. It was called hybrid dwarf wheat. Well, it lifted people out of famine. Wheat yields nearly doubled in Pakistan and India just because of this invention and Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. Without Norman Borlaug's invention, we would not be able to feed the seven and a half billion we feed now. We need more inventions like that. Thinking outside the box, not just growing crops in regular ways and saying like, what if we water them more? What if we add pesticides to the way we already grow crops? We need to make super crops and grow them in super ways. People are working on that, but that's one. Two, fewer forks. Ultimately, we live in a fishbowl, in an aquarium. Earth doesn't get any bigger. We just use the things that are here over and over again. Can the Earth keep up with the current population growth? Of course it can. We'll just destroy more of it as we continue to live here. There is a lot of empty space on our planet, but we can't just keep occupying more of it until there's none left. The World Watch Institute, a think tank on global environmental concerns, says that if you split the world into 100 square meter blocks, that is a hectare, that would be 1.9 blocks per person for food, for absorbing waste, and to produce all their textiles and you know cotton and stuff. That's it though. And so what we need, according to this, is fewer forks, i.e. we need people to not overpopulate the planet. It would be better for the planet long-term if we get to a replacement rate, says Cohen. We get to 2.1 children per adults. 
uh, that would be a sustainable population. And I know this is ethically very difficult. Maybe pay people to have 2.1 kids, then they can choose to do what they want. If you have ideas, share them. That's tough though, fewer forks. Three, better manners. In Star Trek, the Vulcans landed once Zephram Cockburn warped near the planet and showed that we were ready to meet people from other planets because we were beginning this journey into the cosmos. Earth started becoming one planet and better manners means exactly that. We need a global culture that needs to adapt to how we have to live on this planet. Humans need to work together, be more than individuals and warring nations and fighting people. This is outside the scope of a nerdy science show like this one, but I'd love to hear your ideas on it. Cohen says, we need all three of these things in order to survive long term. He says to get there, we need to promote access to contraceptives, develop more economies, save children, empower women, educate men, and do all of that at once. I'm not thinking on any of those things are crazy. It actually sounds really great. It sounds like we probably should just do that anyway, but hopefully we can also do that while sustainably building a new food system because we're gonna need it. There are these things called planetary boundaries that environmental scientists identified. Uh, here's a graphic. And as of now, we are pushing four of these boundaries. Biosphere integrity, biogeochemical flows, that is phosphorus and nitrogen, climate change, and land system change. And we can't push all of these boundaries to the limit. It would be bad. This isn't like a West world. You can't just push them all to max and say, now you're awesome. We are ruining the planet and we're gonna start running out of food. Hybridized wheat was a great invention. We need the next hybridized wheat. We were gonna run out of oil, so we started fracking mountains apart to get more. We're gonna run out of clean air, so we better scrub it clean with these things that we then have to throw away. But you know, then we have this trash that's filling up these landfills and we don't really have anywhere to put it because the ocean and animals are dying. There's no solution where we can continue living the same way. We do not live in a robot. We live in an ecosystem. It's all about balance. And it's funny, a lot of people think nature is just like a robot. It can be programmed and it behaves logically and it self heals, but it doesn't. Check out nature's weirdest events, things like sinkholes and exploding toads. Nature is so weird, y'all. <laughs> this is just one of the crazy amazing series and documentaries on CuriosityStream. You should definitely use my link, curiositystream.com slash trace, promo code trace, and it will be a dollar a month for a year. You can watch dinosaurs, physics, global warming, the history of the internet, they have got it all. Plus, using that promo code TRACE, you're gonna get CuriosityStream for a dollar a month for a year. You also get Nebula 2 included. That's cheaper than getting either of them individually. I've talked about Nebula before here, so let's be honest, it's great. It was nominated for a streamy, that's how good it is. Nebula is a streaming service that I helped start with a bunch of other thoughtful, curious, amazing humans like Jordan Harrod and Polyphonic and Renee Ritchie and Patrick Willems and T1J and Real Engineering and Real Science. I, we have so many people, it's hard to keep track of all of them. And we own the streaming service. So by joining it, you actually support us directly. And again, you get it for free with CuriosityStream for only a dollar a month. It's the only way to get it because it's so affordable. You can watch amazing documentaries and factual series. Hop over and watch one of my series on Nebula, learn about the idiosyncrasies of cinema from Patrick Willems, and then hop back to CuriosityStream to watch some more. CuriosityStream.com slash trace, promo code trace, only a buck a zoid, and thank you. So we know that we started expanding into all the land on the planet several hundred years ago. We cleared it, we threw cattle on it, and cattle started to push out other animals, which is just economics. And we're still doing this in places like the Amazon. Right now we use three and a half billion hectares of land for food, which is roughly the size of Africa, or about one and a half North Americas. And eventually, humans will have to push out the cattle. Probably not before we've destroyed the planet, of course, but instead we need an economics reason to not keep expanding, to not keep polluting. We need incentives. Denmark just recently created a set of taxes on red meat. Maybe we should pay people to not cut down the Amazon. What, what, what would that do? How could that make the Amazon safer? And are there other places we can do stuff like that? Because if we've learned anything from this series, economics is a pretty big pressure outside of classism and evolution. And it's not just who are here now who matter, but the billions who are going to be here in the future. We live in an aquarium. Eventually we're gonna run up against the walls and they are hard limits. This ain't Finding Nemo. We're not gonna hop out the window. That's not possible, not for all of us. We need to change the calculation. So what do we do when the earth is full? Only one thing that we can do that doesn't turn stomachs and that is leave. I have a series on that, you can watch it. But when we do leave, we gotta eat. So what are we gonna eat when we leave? That's next time. 
Thanks so much for watching this series about thinking about food that we're eating all the time. It's the holidays, so there's probably a lot of eating going on, plus pandemic, I don't know about you, but I got that COVID-19 going. Long story short, thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Check me out on social media, at Trace Dominguez. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, you name it, I'm out there, even on Patreon. I am Trace, I'll see you in the future.